<laughs> right, so uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, thank you for, for having me. It's been a, it's been a fun conference. Um, all kinds of interesting things I've heard about. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, my favourite toy language, uh, Idris, which I've been working on for a few years. Uh, and um, it's, it's, really, it's really about, for me, it's about annoyances that, uh, that come up when you're using a computer like, uh, you know, this sort of thing. You maybe can't see this very clearly, but this is, uh, if you've ever programmed in Java on a Windows machine, this will be familiar to you. This is a, this is a series of null pointer exceptions. The unfortunate thing about this screen is that it's the train information display at Crew Railway Station. And uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering which train I should take, and um, uh, this didn't tell me, uh, unfortunately. Um, so this sort of thing, I mean, it's only really an annoyance, because you get your phone out and you have a look, or you ask someone on the platform, or you, you basically someone goes and turns it off and on again. Uh, it's a bit more complicated if, uh, uh, if, if your machine is a spaceship. Um, this, uh, this is Mars Climate Orbiter. This is, uh, this is my favorite ever type error. Um, doesn't everyone else have a favorite type error? Um, this is uh, Mars Climate Orbiter. What it was supposed to do was, was go to Mars and, and relay information from a, a bot on the surface back to Earth. What it actually did was crash into Mars as soon as it got there. Uh, because someone uh, in the ground-based software, someone had written code that was expecting imperial units and it was taking metric units. Which, um, well I guess if you're a, you know, a C programmer, a Java programmer, a Haskell programmer, these two things are the same type. They're just, you know, integers. You know, in my world, this is a type error. And it's kind of an embarrassing and expensive type error. So let's, you know, just think about what we can do to make this sort of thing not happen. So, Idris is a programming language that I've been developing, as I said. It's a, it's a, a Pac-Man complete programming language. I'll, I'll get to what I actually mean by that a bit later on. Um, but just to say now, Turing completeness is overrated. Um, C++ templates are Turing complete. Um, the game of life is Turing complete. That's uh, so a Conway's game of life. Um, seven other configuration files are Turing complete. But if you can't write Pac Man in your Turing complete language, I'm not interested. Idris is not necessarily a Turing complete language. It has a termination checker, it has a totality checker, so you can, you can know for certain <laughs> modulo bugs in the totality checker um, <coughs> uh, that your program is going to terminate. And yes, you can still do interesting graphical uh, uh, programs. Um, one thing I would like to draw your attention to, if you, uh, if you don't do anything else, if you, if, you, if you get nothing else out of this talk, uh, this line, uh, cabal update, if you happen to have a, a working cabal install, um, or working Haskell platform, cabal update, cabal install Idris, that is all you need to know from this talk, you can start playing. I'm going to do a lot of this by demo as well, so if you happen to have a laptop available, then you can just uh, sing along as I, uh, as I type. All of, the, uh, all of the code is available, uh, it's on my GitHub under Idris demo, so you can, you can play along, you can try it afterwards. So, um, a little bit, so I'm going to say a little bit about why types are important. Well, I said a little bit about why types are important. What do we use types for? Um, well, conventionally, uh, we use type systems for checking that the program does the right thing. We might also use type systems for um, guiding the program towards the correct program, so we have the type we're aiming for, we uh, work out how to fill it in, the machine will tell us whether we're right or not. And the thing about type systems is that, uh, I don't know about you, but my parents and teachers, um, before I even went to school, recognized the importance of type systems and they taught me type theory. Did anyone else learn type theory before they went to school? No one. You absolutely should, or somebody did. What was that? Food and not food. Food and not food, yes, that's true. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the type system I had. I, I brought it along. Um, <coughs> this, is a, this is a theorem prover. Um, so, so in the top here, I have, I have all my theorems. These are all my types. Uh, in here, I have some candidate values. Um, so I'll just uh, right here. And so I'm, let's say I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to prove this theorem, star. That's the type of types. Um, so I'll try through that theorem, and um, well, I'll look through my candidate values, and uh, uh, this one works. This one works in here, so I prove the theorem. Hooray! Or oh, what I might? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that call. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I might do is 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 take. A, I've got another value here, and I'm going to try to prove this theorem, and it doesn't really work. 
So I guess I can coerce it. So if you're a if you're a Java, if you're a Java programmer, that's the sort of thing you do. Um, something else you might find children do this uh, when when they get these is, is they've got this theorem, but they've got this value. Try to prove this theorem, and, and you it, it, it's just not happening. There's no way I can make it. Oh, hang on, no, wait a minute. If I had a hammer, got it. Brilliant. Now the the frustration of, of trying to bang something through the right hole. That's like programming, isn't it? That's exactly the same thing as programming. I've got a thing I'm trying to do, and it's just not working. So if you're a C programmer, you just put everything in the back door. <laughs> right, the rest of the talk, I'm going to be working with one of these. It's just going to be a little bit more complicated. I'm going to ask that question again. Who learned type theory before they went to school? Yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> so, um, here I say what type systems are for. So typically we think of them as you know, checking a program has the intended properties that we've, uh, that we've uh, specified. Um, guiding a program towards the correct program because, well, we've got a thing that we're trying to do and we've got some values that might go in it and we're trying. And uh, later on we'll see a little bit of how we can also use them to make fairly generic libraries that are uh, expressive libraries, give us more expressivity, basically. Now, dependent types. So who's come across this concept before? Has anyone not come across this concept before? So I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what's going on. So hopefully, and actually, just also for my own amusement, really, uh, who's, who knows who knows enough Haskell to read it? Is there anyone? That's almost all of you. Um, so even if you don't know Haskell to read it, I hope hope you hopefully you'll be able to see at least from the programs that I write uh, what's going on. So I'm going to talk about uh, dependent type systems. So dependent types, the the, the, the characteristic thing. Um, is really that they allow types to be predicated on values. So, where previously you might, you might say, my type is list. Well, I could say, I have a list of five things, or I have a list of n things, or I have a list of n plus n things. So, because we can predicate types on values, we can be more precise about, um, uh, about sort of what kind of behavior a program might have. <coughs> I'm going to illustrate this idea with uh, several hundred examples. So uh, this, this list of demonstrations, I don't think we, we won't necessarily get through all of these. And because I'm going to do it on the keyboard, it means you can kind of direct me to where you want me to go. So, so I could talk for about four hours on this. Uh, I'll probably, you know, sort of drag me off in a hoop if I, if I uh, try that. But it, basically because, you know, there's various examples here, just let me know which direction you want me to go as, as, as we type. Please ask questions as we go along about what's going on. So I'm going to show you a few of the basic ideas, just the, like some fundamental programs that you will have written before, uh, and just, just to recognize them in this new setting. And I'm going to show some slightly more uh, detailed examples of, of, of some more exciting things that you might want to do. Uh, just before we start, before I get into the live hacking, um, just to get you a little bit familiar with the notation, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, I'll show you um, some basic data types, basic data declarations. So, um, the first one, you know, my favorite type theory, my you know, baby's first type theory example is uh, the natural numbers, the unary natural numbers. Um, so this is uh, a zero or a successor of another natural number. So we're basically counting zero, one, two, three. And I know that underneath, computers typically have integer arithmetic these days. Um, it's still very useful to have, <laughs> still very useful to have um, uh, natural numbers available because they have a very nice structure. They have a structure that's the same in, in a sense, as, as a lot of the other data structures that we work with. So, uh, lists, for example, have the structure that uh, a list is uh, either empty or it's it's uh, got one more thing in it. So we've got an empty list, uh, we've got uh, an element, and we've got another list, and that gives us another list. Um, so I'm writing this down in, in a style where uh, I give this, I give a type constructor, I give all the ways of constructing that type as data constructors, and you can you kind of read these things to the right of the colon. As, as types. So list is in some sense a function that takes a type and gives us another type. So it, it takes a type, say, you know, int or string, and that will give us a list of strings. And then nil, oops, nil, that's, that's a list of some things, it doesn't have anything in it. And then cons, that's a list with one thing and then tables. So it's, it's a function from the element to the rest of the list to the new list. Now, we have dependent types, so we can predicate types on values. Um, so vectors, these are the lists with length. So um, 
as well as bit, bit the vex type constructor says, okay, I have a number, I have a type, that's the number of things in the list, the type, that's the element type, and that will give us a new type. So nil here, that's a vector with zero things in it, so this zero corresponds to the zero constructed here. Nat is just an ordinary, uh, an ordinary type. Uh, Z and S are just ordinary values that are representing zero and successor. So I can have ordinary values in types uh, as long as I say, as long as I say they're coming. So the machine is doing a type check there. And then cons, well, it's just the same, except that we say what the length is explicitly. So we've got uh, a thing, we've got a vector of k things, uh, and that gives us a vector of k plus one things. So using natural numbers just has this nice natural structure that corresponds to uh, the data structure that we might want to work with. Right, so rather than show you the examples in the slides, um, I guess I'll just do this by breaking out the text editor. Uh, so, um, I, could, I could show you hello world, couldn't I? Um, a lot of people, uh, um, when, you, when you see a dependently typed language like, say, Anchor or Cock, you don't, so people tend to dive straight into the, the vector example and forget to tell you, the, the, they don't think that running programs is important. Because why would you run the program when you already know it works? I don't need to test it. Um, I'm just going to do this to show. <laughs> I'm just going to do this to show that you can compile and run a program. So we have a really valid print loop here. Uh, it's a kind of GHCI style. Um, I can compile that. So I can also compile this from the command line, but I could uh, say run go to run it. Hooray! We have hello world. So we've compiled and run something there. Isn't that amazing? Um, let's do something slightly more. So here I'm going I'm to write a couple, of, uh, a couple of functions over vectors. And if you look carefully at the types here, these, these, these types tell us exactly what that program uh, is supposed to do. So I've got a function append, which takes a vector of length n and a vector of length n, and that gives us back a vector of length n plus n. So clearly it's going to be you know, two vectors stuck together. And there's only really, if you think about that for a minute, there's only really one way you can write that program. We're going to struggle to write this program if it's not the append function over these two vectors. I guess we could reorder the reorder the elements, but that would be I mean, that would be not that wouldn't be the kind of natural thing to do given the type. But you could do that. Um, think about giving types. Uh, we're, we're giving quite precise types here, and you might think, well, I'd rather write the program and then have the machine tell me what type my program is. I'd rather have full type inference. Surely, is it, you know, is there some kind of trade-off here? Is there some kind of payoff for writing all of the types there? I'll show you what the payoff is. If you have types, if those types are detailed and precise and they tell you what the program is supposed to do, you don't actually have to write the program, you just ask the machine. So what I'm going to do, you see the comment I've written at the top. So these are um, BIM commands, there's, there's corresponding commands for Emacs that work uh, just as nicely. Uh, so, so backslash D, that will, given a type, will create a template definition. So append x of y's is something. So this, this type checks. I can, I can, I can um, you know, reload that and it says, okay, successfully reloaded. Uh, and I, I can look at the type of this thing here, query append right-hand side, and it will tell me uh, what's in scope and what the type of the thing I'm looking for is. So I've got some clues already. Um, it's normalized plus, by the way. This is uh, detailed. We, we, have, we have type classes, so this plus is actually overloaded. So how are we going to do this? Well, I, I, what we can do is, is look at x's. Um, x's is either going to be nil or cons, nil or, or, or cons form, uh, and then we'll see what happens. So how do I do that? Well, I just ask the machine again. I say, what could x be? X is B, and it tells me. So that was uh, one command. Uh, so now we're doing append empty list and y. So again, we can look at the type of append RHS, and it says, well, you've got y's, that's a vector of m things, and I'm trying to get a vector of m things. So I'll use the um, backslash o command and it says, well, obviously that one, because you haven't got any others. I guess I could reverse it. Uh, so same here. Uh, so I've got a vector of n things, a vector of m things, and I'm trying to get a vector of successor of n plus m things. Um, well, well, let's just ask the machine. Brilliant. There's only one thing it could be, naturally. So why should I have to write that down? The machine will do it for me. Um, something a bit more complicated is, is zipWid. So zipWid, what that does is it takes a function 
and applies that function to two corresponding uh, vectors, uh, vectors of n things. Uh, so I'll do the same thing. Uh, template definition. So there's heuristics for choosing names here. Um, you can actually you can give hints. So I've, I've given it a list of hints that say, okay, uh, x's, y's, and z, uh, z's are good names for vectors. F is a good name for a function. And you can you can overload these with your own when you find your own data types and so on. So um, how are we going to write this? What should I press? Surely, surely he's not asking us a question that easy. Um, backslash C, yes. Um, so we've, um, we've now split X's into the two possible cases. So what do we do next? Well, um, Y's is only going to work. Well, let's, let's try to check this. So um, we've, we've case split off X's, uh, and that's given us an empty vector. And it's noticed that Y's also has to be an empty vector, because otherwise it won't type check. So if I now try case splitting on y's, uh, I only get one option. The other one won't type check, so it's just not going to—it's just not going to present that to me. Uh, and again, well, right hand side, yes, clearly, it's, we're looking for an empty vector. There is only one empty vector. Uh, I'll do the same again. Case split on y's. Yes, there's only one option. And again, there's only one option. So, um, why should I write the program? I've told the machine what we're going to do. It'll do it for me. It's, you know, it's, it's like my, it's the traditional style of programming. It's like you, you go to your shed or you know, your teacher gives you a homework assignment that says write this program. So you, you go to your bedroom and you scribble away and then you hand it back to the teacher or the compiler uh, and, and you get a grade from the teacher. So what you did wrong, you know, C++, must try harder, you know, that sort of thing. And um, rather than that, I didn't mean to say that out loud, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, rather than that, it's much better if you can if you can treat the compiler as just an assistant that that, that says, okay, what are we going to do now? Uh, what's the what's the next step? Um, can you do it for me? Uh, what's the answer? You know, kind of like being a lab demonstrator at university, to be honest. But the, the students come up to you and they say, will this work? And you say, well, there's two ways to find out. <laughs> One of them involves less sarcasm on my part. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, you all had this experience, haven't you? Um, so let's do something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more tricky. So this is just adding two lists together, and, and it's kind of that's a pretty much a problem that we solve in computer science. We know how to add one list to another. Let's let's just do something a little bit more tricky, only a little bit. Um, so because we can write down precise types, we can start expressing proofs of things. So what I've got here is uh, a proof that something is an element of some particular list. So these aren't, uh, these aren't lists with length, these are just ordinary lists. And um, so this, this data type here says, um, uh, well, whenever you see x's coming up, just, just treat it as, as an implicit argument to this, so it's kind of a technical point. So, um, so it's just that uh, x is going to be an implicit argument to these data constructors, and when you see it, it's going to be a list. So either, to say that, uh, uh, to express in a data type at compile time and check it at compile time that A is in a list, A is in some list A. Well, either it's the first thing, it's here, so X is clearly an element of X times X's, because it is, there it is, it's the first one. Or, if I know that X is in the list X's, then I also know that it's in the tail of a list that had something stuck on the front. So it's also in Y times X's. So just as a as an example of how that might work. So second, uh, th this is a proof that two is the second thing in the list one, two, three, four, five. So I'll just do the, 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 the normal thing of create a template definition and ask the machine, and it says, yes, it's, it's the second thing. You go there, and then it's here. I don't know why, by the way, it's felt the need to put brackets around here, but there it is. Um, so if I try something like, I haven't actually shown you any error messages yet, have I? There's a reason for that. Um, okay, this is, um, the kind of error message you might get. Uh, I can't unify LM3345 with LM2345 because you said you've given us a proof for the third thing, and it was actually a proof for the second thing, and uh, two is not three. So if you were if you were in uh, <laughs> Will and uh, Nice Talk, you know all about not being able to uh, unify numbers with each other. Um, so let's put that back. Now, this is a, a compile time proof, and, and unfortunately, 
um, users aren't particularly cooperative in that they tend to give things to your program that they, they, they give invalid data, which is very unhelpful of them, but that's what they do. So if you want to have, if you want to work with this kind of proof, you're going to have to um, you're going to have to check that the data is valid at some point. And once you've got that proof, you can then use it just happily all over the place. But um, sometimes you might need to do some dynamic checking. Um, so really, really what we've got here, I suppose, is, is statically checking that you've done the necessary dynamic checks. And once you've done the necessary dynamic checks, you have a proof that you've done it, so you never need to do it again. And that's, you know, that's a proof that you can, uh, you can keep. So let's just write this function that, that checks whether x is in the list, and if it is, gives us the proof. Um, so this, this deck eq here, um, actually I'll just show you the type. Um, um, oh yeah, it's, uh, you can't read that green, I didn't, I didn't change all my font color I'm afraid. This is just the, the, the function name. Uh, just says if, if, if I know how to decide, uh, knowing how to decide the equality of two things means that if I have an x of type t and I have an x2 of type t, then I will, this data type is either a proof that they're equal or a proof that they're not equal. So um, I won't go into the details of how that works, but I'll show you how to use it. Um, so what we'll do, again, create the template definition. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to check, to check whether x is in x's, we're going to have to check what the form of x's is. So um, we'll inspect x's. And is x in the empty list? Well, of course it isn't. Um, is x in y cons x's? Well, that depends on two things. Either it's going to be y, or it's going to be later in the list. And so the natural thing to do here would be to say, OK, if x equals y, then here. Great. Unfortunately, that's not quite good enough. Because uh, Booleans, uh, Booleans are a code smell in assembly type languages. Because Booleans say, if I say to you, yes, well, you don't know what question. <laughs> you don't know what question I'm answering. It's the same with Booleans. If you see something that says true or false, you don't actually know what question's been asked. So the idea of this, this deck eek um, uh, function is that it keeps track of the question that's been asked in the form of a proof that says you know, what, what it was trying to do. So there's a special form of, uh, of pattern matching for doing this. Uh, the idea is once you look at one thing that has some proof, that might tell you something about the other data you have. And we have to do that uh, basically by adding an extra argument and that's using a construct called with. So what we're going to do is, is decide whether x is equal to y. Uh, and this with pass is now, we can now pattern match. This, this thing is pattern matching on the result of deck x, y. So it's going to give us a, uh, either a proof that x and y are equal or a proof that they're not. So I'll do a case analysis on it. And it says, OK, yes or no. In the case of yes, this argument here, well, I can, we can actually look at its type. Um, this argument here, z, is the proof that x equals y. There is only one proof that x equals y, and that is REFL of x, REFL, reflexivity. So what I'll do is I'll pattern match on that, so case split on z, and two things have happened. Firstly, we see, yes, it's reflexivity, but also, look, this x has become x. So is ln x x cons x's? Well, now we can just use the here constructor. So <coughs> this is a bit where proof search fails me. So the return type here is maybe of ln x x's, and uh, well, nothing actually works. So if I don't give it precisely enough type, it's not gonna, it's not really gonna help. But I can at least say, okay, I, I want to return a value now, um, and if I, if I then do the proof search, it says, okay. Uh, there is something available. Uh, so what if it's not there? Well, I'll just do this quickly, uh, rather than go through all the details. Um, it's maybe is um, uh, is monadic, so I can use do notation. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, hopefully what I'm about to do will uh, still make sense. So I'm going to check whether um, uh, x is in the tail. Uh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Um, so I can still check the type of this, and it says, okay, now I have. Now I have p, which is a proof that x is in the tail. Um, so if this doesn't work, it'll just return nothing. It'll just, it'll just pop out. And then I can return. Uh, should we try? What will happen? What will happen? Oh, brilliant. It did. It worked out that, uh, that it's got to be in the tail. Um, uh, I guess we could run it, couldn't we? 
that in that famous little hand of yours is to enlist one side. Yes, it is. There's, it gives us just the proof that it's there in here. And uh, sit in and enlist one side. Oh, just as a, um, one of the things that I really find annoying about programming Haskell is when we do this melodic uh, style where you've, you've got a melodic thing, you, all you really want to do is pass it on to the next function. You think, well, why do, I, why do I have to go to the trouble of finding everything myself? Isn't that the compiler's job? Well, I decided to make it the compiler's job, so you can actually just do uh, this sort of thing. And get rid of the denotation. And this, this bang, uh, this, this bang notation just means, yes, I know this is something in the monad. You figure out how I'm supposed to find it. And it'll just do the ordinary left to right semantics. And there is actually an argument that we have enough type information that I shouldn't even need that back. The machine should know to put it there. And a few times I've been on the point of implementing that, uh, but, but my users are terrified of it. Uh, and, and there's more than one of them now, so I'm <laughs> little baby steps towards that. Um, anyway, so that's, um, that's your basic um, programming, your basic theorem proving. Um, so we've got the, the, these are the, I mean, the, these are the fundamentals, this is the mechanics of how you write actual real programs. So uh, I guess we could write something a little bit more, a little bit more exciting now. How am I doing for time? Is that halfway through? Okay. Great. Um, so let's do, let's do run length encoding. So run length encoding, um, I was giving this demo to one of our undergrads the other day, and, and I got a few, uh, a few steps in and he said, can I ask a silly question? What's run length encoding? Uh, which is actually not a silly question at all. It's a completely sensible question because you know back in back in the 1980s and 1990s when uh, when graphics were at most 16 character uh, 16 colors, you, you would have um, you know, streams of the same color in a row. So run length encoding, if you're not familiar with it, is just to say we have a number of copies of character or a bit or a, you know, a color, whatever, uh, and then we, we just say number of copies and then the character. Apparently it's still used in fax machines. Uh, apparently people still use fax machines. I, I read that on Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, so what we're gonna do here is, is, is do run length encoding of, of a list of characters, and we're gonna use the type system, firstly to make sure that what we've actually done is a valid uh, compression of the original data, but also to write half the program for us. Um, so what's going on here? Well, firstly, I've got a little convenience function. Um, uh, this probably should be in the library, but this is just doing n copies of a character. So rec of um, a natural number and then some a. I didn't actually need to give this. This, this is a, I, I, I can name arguments. And I, I, I use this partly for um, uh, documentation purposes and partly for naming purposes. So this, the fact that this n is named here is particularly, uh, well, it's not crucial to the program at all. And it's just going to give us n copies of, of, of the character. And then down here I have, um, uh, a run length encoding uh, view, we call this a view, so it's, it's a way of looking at data. It's so it gives us some other patterns with which we can describe the data. So um, our end, that's just the, the run length encoding of the empty list. So we've got to the end, there's no more. And then, well, if I have, if I have an N and a C, so if I have a number of copies in a character, and I have some run length encoding of Xs, that will give me a run length encoding of n copies of c plus x's. So if you believe that this data type really does describe run length encoding of data, this is crucial. You have to believe the data types. Because if you don't believe the data types, how are you going to believe the programs that you write under those data types? The data types tell you the form, uh, everything about the data that you want to work with. So if you believe that, uh, then hopefully you'll also believe that should I successfully write this function, RLE, that goes from a list of characters or a list of uh, X's, a list of characters, to RLE of X's, then I really do have a valid view of X's as a run length encoding. Yes, can we believe that? Some shrugging, <laughs> some nodding. Um, well, we'll write the program. Hopefully more of this will become clear. So, just naturally, how would you write this program? I guess you, you, you did, the natural way to do it is just look at the list and then Look at the copies of the look, look at the elements of the list and see if they're the same. And if they're the same, stick them all together and then um, and then move on to the next one. So we know how to do that. Uh, we know roughly what the plan is going to be. Um, 
It's kind of boring if you know what the plan is going to be for writing a function to actually have to do the job. It's like, I know how to do this, why can't the machine do it for me? So what we do, we'll, uh, okay, we'll, 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 make a, we'll make a definition, uh, we'll, we'll case split on x's, so what's the run length encoding of an empty list? Uh, well, the machine knows it's, that's just it. What about uh, a run length encoding of, of x cons x's? So I've got character and I've got some more stuff. Um, so a good way to start would be to find out what, what happens when I compress the other stuff. So what happens when I compress the other stuff? And because, um, because RLE has, has um, this, this parameter x's, when I do pattern matching on RLE, so we saw this with uh, recyclable equality, when you do pattern matching on something, that tells you about the form of other things. So if I do pattern matching on, on, uh, on, on a run length encoding, that is going to tell me about the form of the thing it was encoding. Um, and, well, let's, let's see what happens here. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, an encoded version of X's, and then I'm going to pattern match on the result. So what happens? I get these two patterns. So because I've written down this data type, I'm allowed to pattern match on things that are more complicated than just the ordinary data structures. I'm allowed to pattern match on the form of things, on the general form of things. So either I have X followed by the empty, uh, the empty um, uh, list, in which case, well, that's just going to be uh, one copy of X followed by the end. Or I have X followed by N copies of C followed by the rest. Um, and the rest is represented by this R's, this run length encoding of, of, of the rest. So um, I have n copies of C and I have an X. So the question is, do I want to add, is, is X the same as C? If X is the same as C, then I want one more copy of it. So I'm just going to do the same as before. Uh, I'm going to do uh, decidable equality on X and C. Basically, never use equality, just use decidable equality. The runtime behavior is exactly the same because proofs get erased at runtime, you get a constructor that says yes or no, which is a straight up isomorphism to true or false. Uh, so always use decidable equality because you have more information to work with. So I'll do decidable equality on it, so I'll have patterns. Oops, what happened there? Uh, moved it along. I like it when I accidentally make mistakes because then it shows that, uh, it shows that this is all a setup. Um, so let's do pattern matching on that, and it's, uh, well, same as before. Um, so now, Now we have that, uh, we've got an X followed by N copies of X followed by Y's. So I can, I guess I could just say, right, okay, I've got N plus one copies of X and then, oh, I don't know, it's even over there. That didn't work. Oh, it did work, that's, that's the wrong button. So, um, so N copies, uh, successor of N copies of X plus the rest of the encoding. Yeah, question. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So uh, the question was, if, if, if you just have one copy, you repeatedly have one copy, uh, would that be okay? Well, yes, it would be okay. So what I've got here is, is, is sound, but not complete. So it's, it's, there's no substitute for actually knowing how to write a program. You, you, you're never gonna be able to write a program just by writing down the type and having the machine know for you, unless you're extremely lucky. And even if you are extremely lucky, if you don't know what the program does, how are you gonna know that the thing that came out was the thing you wanted? So there is still a certain amount of work you have to do. And th th there's certainly no guarantee here that, that I've got the best encoding, but I've certainly got a guarantee that I've got a valid encoding. So that is a good question, and that sort of thing. It's a kind of trade-off that you make all the time, is the, the more precision you put in the types, um, maybe the more work you have to do to convince the machine that you've done the right thing, um, but you know, the, more, the more guarantees you get. So there's just a trade-off with where along the spectrum you want to be. So here I'm only really interested in the technical. Um, okay, and if it's not, then um, well, I'm going to be picky about what I put my equal sign probably. Um, so, so I have one copy of x plus, oh I don't know, oops, R's. One copy of x plus uh, the rest. And I don't want to figure out what the rest is because the machine will do it for me. Um, so this is, this is a function which takes uh, some list of characters and then gives us uh, an intermediate structure that says uh, what the structure of the encoding is going to be. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's only really useful if I then use it to write a, a function that actually compresses it into a string. Um, so, well, we can just do that by, uh, uh, by pattern matching on, on, 
we've got we've got a list. We'll pattern match on the run length encoded version of that list, and then um, uh, I won't bother filling out the details. But basically, it's just to say, right, well, I've got I've got n copies of C, and then I've got the rest. So however you want to render those n copies of C in your string or in your your bit stream or whatever. Um, okay, so uh, that's using the type system to guide us to um, a sound version of some compression algorithm. So RLE, okay, people don't really use it much anymore. But you could imagine doing this sort of thing if you had the, uh, the patience and the, the willingness to prove something sound, which you could do this for some other compression scheme uh, if, you, if you were interested. So any questions on that before I move on to the uh, slightly more realistic <laughs> demo? Realistic. Because remember I said Pac-Man completes, and I, I want to give you some justification of that. Um, um, so, um, also I showed you, I, I showed you the Mars Climate Orbiter and you're thinking, this is all very well, but none of these programs are going to get us to Mars yet. Um, well, um, and real world programs have side effects anyway. You know, we've got stage, we've got interaction, we've got things going wrong. We have to deal with, with not only invalid user input, but in, you know, bad effects from outside, you know, um, subsystems not working, all that sort of thing. Um, so I have a little, um, a little example program here. This, this is based around um, uh, a library of um, uh, side effects, side effecting programs. Uh, it's kind of like if, if, if you've ever used, uh, written any reasonably sized program in Haskell, you've probably started using one out transformers um, to describe you know, the, the, the state and, and the I.O. and the exceptions that might happen. Um, so I've, uh, I, I was a bit unsatisfied with that, and I thought, well, can we do better? Do we have an expressive enough type system that I can somehow write a program that says what effects my real program is allowed to use. Uh, so this is using that library. So this dash p effects flag is just to say use the use the effects uh, package. Um, so here I have a little example program. Because uh, I'm a programming language researcher, what I do with my programming languages is I use them to write smaller programming languages. This, you know, I have an implementation of white space in here. If anyone's interested, for example, because you know why not? Um, so this is a little programming language that just has uh, variables, it's got values, and it's got addition. So it's, you know, it's, uh, we call this uh, uh, Hutton's Razor, after Graham Hutton, who said, you know, when you want to demonstrate something about a language, pick the simplest possible language that demonstrates the point that you're trying to make. So this is a, this is a simple language. Uh, to evaluate this language, um, so it's got variables, which means um, I'm going to have to have some way of looking up the value of those variables. And when I looked up the variable, it might not be there. So I have to have an environment that maps the uh, variable names to their values. So that's what this end is. It's just a, it's just a list of uh, string to integer mappings. Uh, so I don't have type synonyms because types are first class and we can generate types just by writing functions. So this is just a function that calculates a type. Um, and there can also be exceptions. So the way this happens, the way this works uh, in, in Idris is using this um, f data type. And this f data type just gives you a list of all the things that you're allowed to do. Uh, in your program, and you, you can call sub-programs that use a subset of those effects and, and have the underlying machine work that out for you. Uh, so this is a paper from ICFP this year, if you want to know all the mechanics of how this works. And, uh, basically, all the stuff I've just shown you about how to build, uh, how to build theorems that, that, that prove that things are in lists, this is all really important for getting this thing to work. You don't need to know that, you just need to use it. You just need to say, right, well, I have, I have some effects on this. Uh, so this program says, well, if I've got a variable, I'll look it up. Notice I'm using the bang get syntax because I don't really want to have to find out the name just to look it up. Uh, and if it's not there, we've got an exception. Um, and then I've got a test program that adds food 42 to 100. And then down here, I have a, a, another function that, that, that runs that. So any effectful program, I have, to, I have to invoke it somehow. So this run function just invokes that program. And for every effect I have, I have to initialize it with some corresponding um, so it's just like, you know, the run state in Haskell where you have to initialize it with the current state. Um, so if we compile and run that, um, it'll ask me, uh, the main program will ask me for a number, so this is going to be what the variable is, um, and then it'll add that to 42 and 100 and then print out the answer. So the reason the effects system is, is, is useful, or interesting, for me anyway, is that um, if I decide I want to add more, then I can just do that. I don't have to. I don't have to write a new, a, you know, new monad transformer class that, uh, uh, that explains.
ways how these things interact. And I, I don't have to worry about the subsets of results that I'm going to use. So let's add um, random numbers. Uh, so you might think when we do case splitting on something, that's all very well, but what happens if we add something? What happens if we add a new uh, constructor? Well, there's a command for that. Um, uh, backslash m just finds out which cases are missing and adds them. And, and gives you an epidemic. So random numbers are inherently stateful. You've got a, you've got a seed that, uh, that you need to keep going. So how do I make it available? Well, I just have to say so up here uh, at the beginning. And then down here I have to say, uh, I have to initialize the resource, so it's just going to be a seed. Let's have that one. Um, and I guess we could make our test program actually use a random number. And uh, see what happens. Operating instruction. So I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll enter a number. So 58 plus 100 plus a random number is 132. You can't really argue with that, can you? <laughs> um, um, I guess we could add a bit of logging. You need to have the code because I'll have it coming there. And if I'm going to have that logging, I need to say, well, I, I, I need some I.O. Uh, so I'm going to show off the code in a minute. Um, so uh, it goes here. So this is, this is a slight annoyance that you, when you have, when you invoke the program, you do have to initialize the resources, but then you only have to do that once. So uh, I'll show in a moment, I'll show you a, a, an actual application, if that's not too grand a word for us, uh, where, where we do this. And basically you initialize it once and then everything else just uses a, a subset if necessary. Um, so good, do the same thing. Um, so this is a, a 58 and then 32 is the random number. Um, now, this kind of thing, I've, I've started experimenting with using this to structure uh, larger programs. Because it's like, if, if you're programming in Haskell, you have to think about, um, so I use Haskell as an example just because it's, it's the, the de facto pure functional language, I guess. And you have to think about how to deal with all the kinds of impurities that turn up in reality. So typically, you would have some monad transformer sack that says uh, what things are available. Now, personally, what I do is I get bored as soon as there's more than two monads in the stack. So I just, I just pile them all into one giant monad and, uh, and uh, you know, hope that nothing goes wrong, which invariably does. Um, what I think is better is, um, so I have a, a little example here. Although I probably do this don't get this <coughs> packages wrong. So what I do is, is, is say, right, for my program, I'm going to define the list of, um, of resources that I have, or the, the uh, effects that I have that are available to me. In this program, my whole program, uh, well, it runs under I.O. It's, it's got the SDL effect. This I parameter to the SDL effect is, it says whether it's initialized or not. So we're keeping track, we're actually keeping track of the state and the type. If I forget to initialize the SDL effect, right, I don't make a window, then it's not going to compile. So it doesn't make sense to try to draw things when you haven't got a window. So this I is just a parameter that says, yes, uh, my, my thing is initialized. So um, a running program is a program that actually has an SDL surface available. And then I have a few, a few bits of global state. Um, so these, these are all just effects like we saw before. I have some global state, which I've labeled with frames. So I'm keeping track of, of the number of frames. You may be beginning to work out what, where this is heading. Um, so I have a little bit of uh, state that says, OK, what's actually going on in my, in my game? This is my attempt at demonstrating Pac-Man completeness. So it's a game with some state. Um, I have a background scrolly star field, so this, this is keeping track of where things are. And when I run other bits, when I run sub components of the program, I don't really want to, th all of these bits of state are only relevant to certain bits of the program. So if I look in the um, star field implementation, for example, well, the only thing that's interesting if I'm, if I'm working with a star field is uh, if I'm, trying to, I'm basically trying to scroll some stars down the screen. And, and I've got a list of the stars' positions, and I need the random number generator to, to put them somewhere randomly on the screen. So that's all I need. I don't need I.O. I don't need the other bits of the game state. That's all I need, so that's what I save. And so this, um, when I call 
in its star field program. I just, I just do this. I don't, I don't worry about telling the machine that oh, you only use a subset of the effects now. Just get on with it. The machine will figure it out. Uh, similarly, um, we've got a, we've got a game state which is just a record of all the bits of information. So we've got bombs, aliens. Um, uh, I guess you're all thinking, just run it already. So I, I can't send a Mars Climate Orbiter to Mars at the minute, but I can at least um, destroy assignment symbols for my little spaceship. Um, so they're not, they're, not, um, they're not very aggressive assignment symbols. But, um, and I never actually got around to the bit where, I'm going to finish, I'm just going to mess about now. Uh, I haven't actually got around to the bit where the bombs they drop blow up your thing. So that, you know, that really, it's, it's really not particularly challenging. But it, I, <laughs> that, is, that is at least my, 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 my attempt at a proof that you can do more structured, larger applications with, with, you know, with subcomponents that have different bits of uh, state available. And, um, and you know, yes, you can write a space invaders game in a dependently tied programming language. So, um, um, so I guess I'd better get to the end because. So, um, this is all the stuff that I uh, just showed you. So, just to summarize why I think dependent types are important and why, well, why I'm interested in them, uh, types give you lots of things. So, they give you safety because you can check your program against the precise specification. You can know that because it type checks, it's going to work. So, it's precise as you want it to be. So, our run length encoding example, we know that it's safe, we know that it's sound because it type checks. So, there was no way that we could produce a run length encoding of a different list. We've got more expressivity, so we can write, I think, better, more descriptive APIs. So that effects language was an example of, of, of a more expressive API. One thing I didn't show you is, is I'm going to show you the SEL thing with, with you have to initialize, but you can actually take that a very long way. Um, you can, one thing we've done with that is, is have in the resource, in the state, uh, the, 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 the forms that you have, the fields that you have in a web form. So when you add a form, uh, you know which form, which, which um, sorry, when you add fields, you know which fields you've added to the form, and you know what types they're expecting. So when you get to the submit button, you can work out from what you've added what the type of the handler function has to be. So if you have a handler for your web form that accepts the wrong data, it's not going to compile. So you have you have type safe web applications just by using this framework directly, um, and it all you know it all just fits together quite neatly. And uh, I had a student working on that over the summer, and to be honest, we were quite surprised when it worked because. Uh, um, I've got to a point now where, well, I probably should stop being surprised when my programs compile the way I think they should, but I still am. Um, but as well as that, you get type-directed development. So we've seen a lot of, I mean, I, I basically didn't write the programs that, that I've shown you. The machine did. I, I sort of said, well, what are the options available to me now? Tell me what I should do now. I'll tell you the bits that you can't figure out, and then you tell me the bits that are obvious. And so you don't really have to, if you write down the type, so if you do a lot of, if, you know, if you provide the type, you don't have to type. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, committed to making typing easier in more ways than one, as, as someone said uh, the other day. And here's the thing. Your system is supposed to help you. Types are supposed to help you. And there's this, there's this idea that the, the, the type checker is, is some stern teacher that, 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 that you know, hits you if you get the program wrong. That's not what should happen. It should be an assistant that, that, that tells you how to get to the right program, not something that tells you when you've got the wrong program. Uh, also, we, we haven't really seen so much of this, but uh, types give you genericity, so you can, uh, or good types give you genericity, that you can write a program that calculates a type, uh, and then uh, once you've calculated the type, uh, write a program that corresponds to that type. So, so something I'm thinking about at the minute uh, is um, how, to, um, how to do JSON data, for example. So um, dynamic typing fans often seem to wheel this one out. They say, oh, you can't do JSON data in a statically typed language because you don't know its form. Well, I say, you can't write a program if you don't know the form of the data. So how can you write the program if you don't know the form? Well, we know the form, we, we calculate the type from the form, and then write a corresponding program. So you can work with dynamic data at runtime and still have type correctness, um, just because you know, you, basically you're checking in advance that all the possible things that can happen uh, are OK. Um, I don't have an example of that quite yet, but I will soon. Um, and then eventually, or finally, you know, efficiency, hopefully one day, we know more about what a program is supposed to do. That should help the compiler. Uh, so um, these, um, 
uh, the, the zip width and the, the append function that I showed you right at the start. We know that there can't be any runtime errors. We know that, uh, because we know in the type what the length of the list has to be, we don't even need to bother checking whether it's, um, you know, whether the list is empty or not. We know it's not. Uh, we should get some, we should really get some mileage out of that. We should be able to use the fact that we've already statically proved that the dynamic check has happened. We only have to do the check once. And I think it'd be really interesting to go further and see if we can exploit this. Um, so. Finally, just to finish, a um, few possible applications. Um, Dependent type really an active research topic at the minute, getting a bit more trendy. Finally, we're getting some languages that you can actually write programs in. And uh, we're having lots of fun with all of these uh, different possible things that we're exploring. And uh, join us. It's fun. Um, thank you for your attention. Space invaders is open. So, yes. apart from effects, were there any other places where you used interesting types of prefixes? Uh, not really, no. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, just because you have dependent types doesn't mean you have to use them. I think this is something that, that people get worried about when they, when they see dependently typed programs. They say, well, I don't understand this type system. I, I don't want to have to prove my program does the right thing. Well, don't then. <laughs> just write the program the way you want it to. And if you ever need that extra expertise, then uh, yes, you can. But if you don't, then, um, well, why bother? I can't really think, it, 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 it's challenging to think of things that, that you might want to prove about space invaders going to be honest. I guess you might want to show that, uh, you know, if, if, if the bullet collides with an alien, then, then it actually does remove it, that, that sort of thing. But uh, <laughs> I hacked this up the evening before I gave the talk at ICFP, because I was thinking, come on, there's got to be a better demo than my language demo. So this is like, you know, a couple of hours of hacking, so... I guess if I thought in advance about the properties I wanted the program to have, maybe maybe I should have done that. But uh, no, it's all it was all about the, the genericity. And um, underneath, there's a lot of uh, you know theorem proving going on in the library, but not in the not in the application itself. Does actually that that is actually um, a, a, an important point for another reason, which is that one thing I like to do is hide all the the, the type magic behind um, some abstractions. So building verified domain-specific languages for, for whatever thing, so that your domain expert can use those abstractions, can know that because you've done the proofs, or, or you, 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 you insert the right proof obligations, so you can know that what's behind it there works, but not have to understand it yourself. So that's really what uh, you know, domain-specific languages are all about, and that's what we're you know, trying to do here by creating, giving, giving you enough expertise to make good domain-specific languages with, with good verification properties. So that's really what the effect is. Can you do constraints on floating point numbers? So could you say how the type <laughs> that was a uh, floating point number between 0 and 1? Well, you could, but the thing about floating point numbers is they're not really numbers. <laughs> so it's, uh, th there's, there's all kinds of things you have to think about. Now, there are some people at um, uh, Assignment Research Institute in Potsdam who are doing this sort of thing. And th they, they, they're interested in sort of reasoning about economic models uh, and, and solving this, uh, uh, dynamic program problems. And they do do reasoning about floating point numbers in the types, and they do this by adding a few postulates that, um, well, they're floating point numbers, so you have to be very careful about which ones you write down, because some things that you might think are true about floating point numbers are, uh, are lies. So they're a little bit careful about um, whether what they say is true or not. And they, they can certainly say things like a number is within a certain range, um, modulo floating point error. Um, but you have to be very careful. And you really do have to assert facts to the system rather than prove them. And that, that's actually true of all the primitives. You really have to assert things about primitives. Um, well, I guess uh, just to... Uh, I always find this reassuring. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if your system gives you 0.3 for that, either you're cheating uh, or it's wrong. So, yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing to explore. I mean, the whole, the whole thing about Proofs about real numbers or floating point numbers is something we've not explored much. Right, yeah. I so would I. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think 
talking about sort of probabilistic rules that you can write down in a, in a, in a time, and uh, we should talk about this because I'm going to start thinking about it. And I don't really know anything. So. <laughs> um,